Well, hello, humans. We're back uh, for a live show with you today, and we're super excited about that. This is the Tech Humanist Show. It is a program dedicated to exploring how data and technology shape human experiences. Welcome back. Uh, we have an esteemed guest that we've brought in today. Um, it is going to be an exciting discussion. Uh, but since the pandemic has begun, education globally has been through radical and rapid change. And that emergency shift to remote learning forced students to rediscover their learning environment and made teachers reconsider their classrooms and curricula. Those challenges were even more accentuated in some areas, such as in Nigeria, where 44% of the population is under 14 years old. And the average teacher to student ratio is teacher to student ratio. That's what I said, right? One to 44. In comparison, for example, in the United States, 18% of the US is under 14 and average teacher student ratio is one to 16. So those are some pretty big numbers. And so the question is, you know, how do you remotely teach 44 students? How do you even capture their attention? How do you gather them in place? How do you make the most of that situation? And so what do educators need to make the most of the future of technology given these constraints, given these challenges? And beyond those challenges, how do we get more girls in science and technology fields? Well, we're about to delve into all of that and more with our guest today. By the way, this program is brought to you by KO Insights, offering insights to help make the human experiences of the future more meaningful. And this, as you may know, is a multimedia format program, which means that it's being broadcast where you're watching it, and it'll also live on as an archive across multiple channels so people can always find it later. Hello to those of you in the future from those of us in the past. And also, these interview shows develop into podcasts in the weeks to come. So check that out. I hope you'll subscribe or follow wherever you're watching or listening to this so that you won't miss any new episodes. And now to introduce our guest. Today, we are joined by Dr. Holowakemi Olorunola, who is a education, an, an educational technology consultant, speaker, and trainer. She is founder of Exquitech Education Technology, an ed tech consultancy and a Microsoft global training partner. She's also a lecturer with the Department of Science and Technology Education, Olabisi Onanbanju University, Ago Iwoya, and who works part-time with the Department of Education Technology, Taisalaran University of Education, Ijibo, Ijibo Ode, both in Nigeria. And I know, I know I probably haven't pronounced those names very well at all, uh, but I'm going to beg your forgiveness on the pronunciation. I want also want to mention Aloha Kemi is an associate member and global impactor with the Digital Citizenship Institute and leads the DigSit Guards. I may not be saying that correct either. A team of educators passionate about the care, well-being, and safety of students in the digital space. And they have reached thousands of students with the digital citizenship message. She's a Microsoft innovative educator, uh, expert and fellow, and also a Microsoft global learning mentor quite a set of credentials. So audience, get those questions ready for our outstanding guests. And with that, please welcome Dr. Holowakemi Olorunola. Holowakemi, you are live on the Tech Humanist Show. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Kate, for having me on. Did I, did I butcher those names, the pronunciation of those names too badly? Yes. No, okay. not too badly. Yeah. You did well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I promise to try to do better in the future. It was um, it was a, a lot of names that I had to look up and, and familiarize myself with. Uh, it's it's wonderful to have you to challenge us and make sure that we're seeing the global perspective. Uh, you know, the last few years uh, with, between COVID and the the push to online learning platforms, how has that changed uh, what you do and what your passion is? I mean, you have so many activities that you're involved in. What what has the last few years been like for you with all that? Okay, so um, I've always been an enthusiast when it comes to um, technology integration in the classroom. And um, we've tried to promote the use of technology adoption. And um, of course, pre-COVID, um, we had some resistance and um, of course change, not too many institutions or teachers were willing to change. Um, but then uh, the COVID came and then what seemed to be like a luxury that we are offering became a necessity. And so for people like us, we had a lot of work to do at that point in time, um, helping teachers learn how to 
um, continue the classroom engagement and since um, it became obvious that we weren't sure when this pandemic was going to be over and things were going to return to normal. And so the new normal had to be embraced. And uh, so we saw a lot of work trainings going on, teachers learning, um, discovering tools to use and all that. But there was a high rate of adoption um, during that period and schools began to embrace um, the use of, of technology at actually all levels from higher ed, even to um, the lower um, primary levels. So uh, the, the pandemic actually um, helped us increase our level of adoption, of use of technology in the educational sector. Yeah, and that's wonderful to hear that it, it was a, a, a sort of catalyst for adoption of technology, but I'm sure it also brought its challenges, uh, especially in more remote areas uh, for students who had lack of access to, to broadband or lack of equipment or conflicted priorities when they couldn't get to the classroom. So what, do, what would you say that students and teachers have learned from these last few years and, and how have students and teachers gotten around some of those limitations? Okay, so um, we had all forms of interventions as a country and um, because we were aware that there was a disparity in their access to technology and um, especially for the not to um, develop cities and um, schools in the remote areas. And so from the government's um, interventions, you had um, um, some um, radio broadcastings, you had TV um, stations taking up um, um, teacher uh, contents, you know, teachers teaching by the television and then, but for some of the schools who could afford it, there were some form of technology integration at different levels. And so the beauty about that period was even the creativity of the teachers. So um, we saw a lot of creativity where teachers began to use tools not originally developed for academic purposes, but we saw them adapt and that to meet the needs, the need to connect with their students even during this period. And I believe one lesson learned um, was the importance of technology to our everyday lives. And um, realized that we couldn't just um, adopt the ostrich approach where we dug in our heads into the sand and hope that this disruption kind of um, finds its way and uh, we are safe. And so we had to stand up and embrace this change, you know, empower ourselves to position ourselves to go along with the tide. And in fairness to the teachers and to the students within that period, we saw a lot of them taking up these challenges head on, you know, and because the disruption was sudden, teachers weren't really prepared, um, but we saw a lot of them take up crash courses, uh, you know, and improved on their professional development, you know, learning how to use uh, various technology tools. And all this was just ensure that con learning continued even though the pandemic was um, on. Now, you have also talked about uh, calling for the Nigerian government in particular, but I think this is probably a, a common need uh, globally uh, to provide stable electricity, utilities, stable internet service. Um, are there other uh, sort of learnings from this that you would say for government or for uh, regions and municipalities that they should be thinking about how to empower educators and students? Yeah, one of the lessons um, taken away and uh, was the, actually the gap, the, the skill gap of the teachers, because no matter how we've seen governments um, um, budgets, you know, or, or spend on technology, and then you still have that skill gap there. So one of the major things we saw the government do in recent time, and I think that they are learnings from the experience is teacher development. So there has been a lot of teacher training, especially where digital skills are concerned. So we've had a lot of government initiatives, government uh, involvement in upskilling um, teachers, especially with digital skills. And so that's one of the major things that um, the government has um, learned from this period and uh, they're doing, because we had, we have state, we've had states in interventions where whole states um, um, was engaged in training the teachers for across all uh, the levels, the primary and secondary levels of that period with digital um, skills, you know, learning various tools and all that. So we've seen that done across the country, we've seen that done in various states. So professional development for teachers is something that um, this period are waking for um, the government and also for school owners as a whole. Yeah, and then of course, we know that our challenges like infrastructure, lights, um, electricity, um, internet access, we still a challenge to till today. And but, um, we've seen other um, incentives where edtech solution providers are offering 
solutions um, to meet these needs, you know, um, data bundles or uh, solutions that require uh, less internet connectivity and all that. So there's been a lot going on um, trying to meet the needs and close the gap where this is concerned. That's great. That sounds like very creative problem solving. Speaking of creative problem solving, though, I was uh, you were mentioning something about uh, teachers teachers reskilling and upskilling uh, relative to technology, but you also talked about teachers using creative means of engaging their students. And these aren't necessarily uh, what you might think of as high technology kinds of approaches. Now, I, I know that uh, my our research turned up that you are industrial an industrial designer by background, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so I think that really shows itself in some of what I saw on uh, on your LinkedIn, for example, you shared about a um, a project that you had students do, where they used materials that were close by, yes, to create instructional aids. Right? Can you tell us about this project? Okay, so um, sometimes when we think about to enhance um, the teaching and learning, and we think about instructional materials, most times we're looking at how to get these things bought. You know. Um, we, we are talking about budgets and, and all that. While if we do look around us, there are things that um, you could pick up and uh, convert them to materials or, or products that you can actually use to uh, uh, explain a concept. And so we had this project and we had key, um, students um, think about a concept they wanted to um, teach and um, look at things around them, things that you can pick around and develop a product that can be used in the classroom to teach that concept. And we had very interesting um, submissions to it. And so that's just <laughs> one of the samples I put out there. So we call that low cost um, interventions. Yeah, low cost. And, and it sounds like, you know, one of the things that really struck me is that it ties so perfectly into, when I looked at UNESCO's recommendations for how to get more girls involved in STEM, which I know is a major passion area of yours, and I want I want to talk about that with you. But one of the things that they talk about is using more tangible, more you know, sort of uh, graspable, concrete examples rather than the abstractions that many times we talk about in science and technology. And this seems like what a perfect way to not only use these uh, nearby materials but also make these ideas very concrete for, for students. Yeah, it's it's cool. wonderful. Wonderful. I also saw um, an, another example of some creativity. You talked about uh, a program that students were participating in that where they were doing hands-on activities that involved things like uh, Legos and game development and things like that. What about this? Can you tell us about this, this workshop? Okay, so um, one of the common practices for us here is during the holidays, and I guess basically because um, parents still have to go to work, and um, so we have what we call the summer school. Um, but our summer schools um, kind of continue with the cognitive um, academic uh, contents. You know, you still have to do the maths and the English. And so and, um, I haven't been a... a, a um, uh, like, like say, really in support of such kind of engagement because I believe that there is a reason why there was a break in the calendar for these children so that they could do other <laughs> things apart from the classroom cognitive assignment works and all that. Yeah. And so to provide a solution for that, um, I decided to have, run a summer school, which I've done for the past few years now. And so, but my summer schools, we call it SELECT, we, um, the acronym S-E-L-E-C-T, -E which is a school of entrepreneurship, um, etiquette, leadership, um, sorry, creativity and technology. That's and great. So we do all, we do all um, uh, our curriculum is focused on developing leaders, helping their creativity skills and uh, of course their technology skills and all that. So we're creating all sorts during that long summer break instead of the normal classroom engagements that they would have had in school. So that's what the program is. And so we do, um, of course, coding, programming, um, um, arts and crafts. Now we have speakers we bring in to talk to them about um, leadership and all that. So that's the summer program run for kids during the holidays. I love it. And it seems like it's a great balance of, 
of dealing with the learning loss that that most students experience over the summer with also giving them some sort of a break that's that's fun that's not so you know the same as everyday coursework right yes yeah. <laughs> let's go back to the the topic of girls in stem fields though because that sounds like it is one of the areas that you you are particularly involved in what have been some of the initiatives that you've launched and what what are some of the opportunities that you see how are you addressing some of those barriers okay so um uh, over time you know you, you especially in this climate of us there's this gender stereotyping of um, about the place of a woman and uh, the types of career that she can and she cannot do especially in this part of my world and so to help change that narrative we started what we call the girls in science and technology program and in shorts we call it the gist program and so it's basically an initiative aimed at educating and encouraging girls by providing um, these girls the opportunity to, to learn about stem and um, hopefully pursue stem careers you know most times we um, have this girls in the sciences class in i don't know how it's done in other places but here when we have them at the higher um, school uh, secondary school here then normally separated um, based on their subjects selections and so you have the science classes you have the humanities you have the arts and you walk into those science classes and then you ask um, for their career paths and you have like 98 percent of them went into the medical doctors and nurses or pharmacists and that was just that triangle and i realized i realized that basically it isn't that they loved science but they didn't know what other career options were available to them so you have the the problem of awareness apart from um, gender stereotyping and so I remember that a particular time I ran a program during the girls in science and I invited girls all, um, from science classes. I had over almost 70 girls in, in the hall and I asked how many of them wanted to be medical doctors and you had everybody's hands up. I had only one person in that room of almost 70 girls who was considering a career in engineering. And uh, you can oh. imagine how, <laughs> you know, so, and, you know, in, in asking questions, you realize that most of them weren't even aware that there were other things they could do. So when we run these initiatives, we uh, do these enlightenment talks, we go to schools and uh, give enlightenment talks about other career paths that they can um, follow even with their desire to um, be in the science and tech um, fields. And besides that, we also run um, free workshops. We do digital um, trainings, um, ICT tra free IT skills training for them. And, um, and and sometimes we, uh, if we have the opportunity to collaborate with all the um, tech providers, we run um, robotic cl clubs and and all that for them. In, in even um, just to expose them to these things and to make them see that this uh, is not just uh, gender bias in itself. It's not a means a male's domain. It's something that they can also find interest in doing and also create the path for themselves in it. And one of the things we love to do is to show them uh, videos also of uh, women who are actually blazing um, different career paths, even in the science and tech um, field. So they know that this is a possibility. They have people they can look up to and mentors that they can say, okay, if she can do it, then why can't I also do it if I have an interest in this field? And so basically that's the, uh, the core of uh, our, our initiative. Um, driving this um, STEM narrative um, for the girls. And hopefully we uh, desire that as we do this, I'm actually looking forward to a time when I actually, uh, we have these clubs situated in um, these schools and we can engage with them on various STEM activities that are aligned to the um, their subjects, the courses they actually do in school so they can see how um, this learnings of science actually meets the town you know basic uh, community needs and all that so that's one of the projects we're hoping to do in future that's wonderful and it sounds like so much of what it affords you the opportunity to do is demonstrate creativity with with the students like help them think creatively about what the future possibilities are right instead of thinking it's just doctor or maybe it's engineer but really not <laughs> that's not even on people's <laughs> minds but there's so many uh, engineering and and technology fields that yeah. that maybe just kids don't think about. I mean, I I don't think that I knew that I could be a tech humanist when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I I am curious too about um you know I, I read somewhere that you are interested in in developing mobile labs to bring technology to remote areas. Can can we hear about what the idea is there? 
Okay, so um, there are sometimes, like I said, sometimes I get um, to partner with some other tech bodies and then we bring some of these um, uh, workshops into my area. I live in the not, uh, not uh, what I would call a sub um, I don't live in the city. And so I have a lot of um, schools in the remote areas that I do get engaged with. And so when we have these workshops, and I purposely will want to encourage uh, students from the public schools that don't have access to these things to be part of these workshops. And when they come over, we see that they actually have the flair, they have the, what it takes to actually um, succeed in these areas. You know, I remember a particular um, workshop we did. We had the public school students come. We had students from private schools, highbrow schools. And I found that these students, even in the public schools, were accomplishing their missions with ease and they were faster at finishing you know and i realized that if only we could get more of the students i know somebody has asked me when you do this and you go and they don't have the opportunity to do it again and so what difference does it make and i say even if i the only thing i achieve at doing is birthing a spark in them sparking up something in them helping them know that yes this is something i can look forward to or dream about then I have succeeded in doing, um, I, you know, in achieving at something. But then, if I do have the opportunity, I have always dreamt about a STEM lab, mobile lab. You know, and I have that opportunity to pack all those things into a, a, a van and take it to where they are on a rotation basis. So that's what the dream is. Uh, my desire is to take it to these schools, this um, on the self schools at the regional phase, because they're going to do one or two or three or four geniuses, um, innovators that are in that place, but because of lack of access, the creativity and the, uh, is not uh, uh, um, birthed or enhanced. And so that's my desire, especially for on, 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 the, on the self schools. It's wonderful. I mean, I, it sounds like it's so valid to, to me that sometimes it does take just that one exposure for, for a kid to have the idea that there might be something more to this that they want to pursue. What about for yourself? What what was it that brought you into got you interested in technology when you were uh, coming up? I know we, we talked about how you you uh, your education is in an industrial design, but what even got you interested in, in industrial design? Okay, I've always had that creative flair. I've always wanted to uh, do things, you know. I loved colors. I loved um, organizing and all that. And so I, I, industrial design was like a natural for me. Um, but coming into educational technology was, uh, I, I think it was a aha moment. Um, I actually uh, had watching the program on TV and I watched out some years back, I watched how uh, a topic, chemical bonding, was being animated. You know, and I thought to myself, who are those making learning as fun and visual as this? And, uh, you know, it made me think deep and I began to dig into finding out those who were responsible for creating this kind of content. And I realized that, oh, um, these are jobs of industrial designers and under the large canopy of educational technologies and all that. And I said, I think this is something I want to do. If I was taught in this way, I know how I'll have performed better at my final exams in school. And so that was how I started on the educational technology path. That's wonderful. What a great uh, spark that got you started. And I, I can see how you believe that you could get that same spark going for, for other students as they figure out what, what possibilities are in front of them. Now, I know you've also taken this educational technology interest and you've uh, built a, a firm, you know, at least one. You've, you've done some entrepreneurship prior to this, I believe, but you have a consulting firm and that, that firm provides uh, professional development and advising and, and to technological instruction. Is that right? Yes. And, and so what, what are you seeing happen? What, what trends are you seeing emerge in your work over the past few years? Are you, are you seeing uh, things that are happening, um, I, guess, I guess, even despite the pandemic, you know, what, what the COVID pandemic, what, what have you been seeing uh, emerge as it relates to technology trends for education? Uh, well, um, we've seen a lot of uh, startups on the ed tech space in recent times, uh, as of against um, what it used to be before the 2020s. And um, so 
And then, like I said, we've seen a lot of adoption also and embrace of the educational technology sector into the uh, schools. So um, initially it was difficult building up uh, this firm and because you needed uh, a lot of convincing to do um, when you um, go to engage with the schools or, and, and I know, uh, why do I, why do they need to change what they've been doing? Things are working, everybody's good. And so you, <laughs> you needed a lot of convincing to do, but now with the knowledge of the technology and how it's the benefit in, in the classrooms to the educational sector, not just about um, even with management, um, education and delivery of content, assessments and all that has been uh, a better um, acceptance a bit, uh, uh, an embrace of this field. So for us, it's, it's like our time, our season, you know, kind of as against um, some years back. You know, I remember introducing myself sometimes to people and I say, so what do you do? I say, I'm an ed educational technologist. And they're like, what's that? And so, <laughs> but now it's, it's easier uh, to say, oh, this is what I do. And you have a lot of people understanding what you're talking about now. So there's been a lot of change in that sector. An immediate frame of reference for it, it sounds like, that people are able to connect with now. Yes. Uh, yeah. What, what, in your view, though, when you think about education and technology, it sounds like it seems as if there are some areas where technology can certainly be helpful. It seems like also there are some areas where we need to be careful about the risks and harms that it could do. What are some of those watch outs? What are some of those areas that you think that we ought to be paying attention to? Okay, so one thing I, I would normally say is you don't use technology for technology's sake. It's not just about, oh, we have the technology. Because, you know, sometimes we engage with some schools and they'll tell you, oh, I'm ICT compliant because they have uh, quite a number of laptops or, or, or desktops. And, but then you go into how these things, uh, these devices are being used and you see that basically all they're doing is substituting their... Um, contents you know, converting their hard notes to soft copies and all that and that isn't really what technology integration is really about and so it's not technology for the sake of technology and you know sometimes you also see where budgets and the large amount of money is spent buying devices and because we um, there used to be this imagination that once you have technology in the hands of students and then um, definitely there's improved learning and we know that that is not true and so that's something which uh, one needs to understand and because technology has to be used purposefully. And so you don't um, also invest in technology as a body or as a school or as a government without also investing in the commensurate skills acquisition for those who will be handling or using that technology. Mm. So you don't, one comes before the other. So before I'm putting the technology in the classroom, what is the purpose? What, what, what is my vision for technology? Do I have a plan? Uh, and so when that is done, then you know what kind of technology you need. And because I believe that um, te technology use, uh, limited technology use, it's not really about the quantity of technology or the quantity of devices that you have access to, but mainly how you use that device. Because I've seen um, situations where you have, uh, you don't have, you have teachers with, that, with little access to technology, yet they are doing very inspiring and innovative things with their technology. And then you have schools with so many technologies, and yet they're just at the basic level of technology integration. So technology use isn't really about the quantity, but about the quality of use um, where, those, uh, where the technologies are concerned. And another thing, again, um, we need to get against when we talk about educational technology or the ch is change. You know, one of the things that are the major uh, problems we have is resistance to change. And so when you want to totally overturn what was, and oh, there's this new thing, uh, we need to jump on board and all that, there's a tendency that you find that resistant world. But when you, when you make it scalable, you know, step by step, okay, let's start from how we do our recordings and start from how we deliver content and go into assessments. So there's a scaling plan, you know, understand? It's not, oh, the, we're changing the whole hall. You wouldn't get the buy-in. But when you have that plan of how you scale your use or your integration of technology, then you begin to see technology happen for you and you, you see um, easy adoption and, or embrace of technology by um, being implemented. So um, that's one thing. And then secondly, especially, okay, I, that's the third, especially <laughs> in this period <laughs> where you, you know, because of the pandemic, you had a lot of people um, bringing up solutions, tech solutions and all of that. 
And so I just want to say here that not every solution that has education in front of it is actually a solution for the educational for, for, for your educational sector. Um, because when you actually do um, provide tools or resources or solutions um, for the sector, um, like every good meal, there are different ingredients that you that come to the mix that makes the meal palatable and delicious. And the same thing with providing solutions for educational um, sector where technology is concerned. You need not just a technology expert um, just providing a solution. You need the mix of a technology expert. You need the mix of a content expert. You need the mix of a pedagogical expert. And then you need the mix of those who are going to be using those technologies, the end users. And when you have all those people on, ta on the table, then you ensure to provide a solution that will actually meet that need in the educational sector. So you don't just sit and assume that, oh, there's a need. And I, from my, my bedroom or my, my, my office, I can imagine, assume what the need is. And I assume I have what the solution is. And then I produce something, I put in the market. And you know sometimes you get to use those things and you see that they don't meet the need as you had expected them because the mix was missing. So, and those are some of the points that when we consider um, things to be cautious about, and um, also where it comes to the side of the students, we know in recent times, because there has been an increase in um, digital access, not only for the academic purposes. And so we've also seen some problems like um, cyberbullying and all that. So we ought to be also aware about how to guide and guard uh, our students um, where a technology use is concerned. So because they can use uh, technology doesn't know, mean that they know how to use it appropriately. And so we need that um, education also coming side to side with their use of technology for educational purposes. Yeah, that sounds like a great segue into the whole digital citizenship discussion. So the cyberbullying and how to conduct your life online appropriately and safely sounds like it's part of it. What are some of the other considerations? What what is digital, digital citizenship for our listeners and viewers? What 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 is a definition or an idea that they can take away about what digital citizenship is and why we should be concerned about it? Okay, so I I would say digital citizenship is a uh, just as you're a citizen of any other country, uh, it's it's belonging to a digital community of diverse people, and then understanding the rights and the responsibilities that comes with being a member of that digital uh, community. And then since digital citizenship is driven by the digital, it's also a means of using technology in a responsible and positive way within the community. And, uh, uh, you know, digital citizenship, citizenship, sorry, for me, isn't really about um, doing, it's more about being, you know, and we, when we talk about digital citizenship, we talk about being, and um, we say you're, you're being inclusive, that is you're open to hearing and respectfully recognizing multiple viewpoints, even in the, in the community there, you are informed, you, uh, you have evaluate the accuracy and the perspectives and validity of the digital media that, that comes, you know, come your way and you see in your social posts, you're someone who is engaged uh, you use technology and then uh, the digital um, channels for engagements to solve problems, to be a force for good and all that. You're balanced, you know, you, you're not just all in the digital space, but you have a good offline and online um, balance. And then, of course, you're alert. Uh, you're aware of your online actions. You know how to be safe online and, of course, to also create safe spaces for others. So for us, digital citizenship isn't just about the do's and don'ts, but the being. Being, being informed, being inclusive, being engaged, being balanced, and of course, being alert. Oh, what a beautiful model that is. It seems uh, very holistic and, and integrative with the way we exist online and the way we interact with others online. So that's a, that's a great way to introduce young people into a way of being in, in the online space that feels very true. Well, thank you for sharing that. I also wanted to Follow up on, you know, you talked about, you were making this analogy about earlier about um, technology and and how it can best be adopted in the classroom and in, in educational institutions. And you talked about food, which, you know, gets right to my heart. <laughs> like, But you use the analogy of like uh, recipes and a mix and things like that. And what it strikes me that you're saying, and I want to run this by you as a, as a test of an analogy, is um, it, it sounds as if you're saying that you could have the best kitchen in the world if that's the technology 
but you have to prepare the people who are actually going to be cooking in the kitchen or, or using that kitchen, right? The educators, they need the resources. They need to understand what that kitchen is capable of if, if we're going to stretch the analogy. Is that fair? I mean, that, that seems like the, the, the educator resources sound like they're a really big piece of making the education technology yeah. successful. Yes, that, that's, that's actually what I'm saying. Because oh. yes, you have sometimes you have these wonderful tools and uh, uh, okay, so, okay. Like I was giving an illustration. Sometimes uh, there was a time I sat at a training um, at my university, and um, we were trained on the particular use of a, of a tool, a particular tool. And because these were people from the tech area, and their specialty was on the technology, and so we, of, we were taught how to operate this tool and what the tool can do. And so the question I asked after that is that, okay, so how does that translate to my use as a teacher? How does it help me teach maths or English or geography, whatever subject it is that I, I need to teach? So like you said, if you get into a, a, a kitchen that is all furnished <laughs> and so this is a beautiful kitchen, everything you need is here, uh, please feel free and make use of it. Uh, no matter how good the chef is, uh, at the beginning it's going to struggle because it's going to need to know oh, where is the oven? Where do I switch on this and all that? And may spend so much time trying to find his way through the kitchen before he now begins to uh, make the meal. And if he doesn't know where maybe the salt is uh, <laughs> and you hadn't labeled it properly to say this is salt and all that, there's a possibility that something will be missing from the meal. But then if you have all that laid out, Okay, so this is lab labeled, uh, everything put in place and all that. And so a, a, a chef comes in and a good chef, a good chef. Let me use the word a good chef. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because something, again, technology doesn't yeah. do is convert you to be a good teacher. So okay, um, like somebody says, technology is like an accelerator. If you're a good teacher and you know how to use technology well, you would, uh, of course, have improvements in your teaching and learning process but if you are not a good teacher and you are handling technology to also fast track your disaster in the classroom so yeah um, yeah so those are like, like we need to balance it here so uh, that's what it is so that's peda that's why i say it's a mix because you have the technology you have the pedagogy and then you have the contents and most times we have the mastery of the contents and and then we are lost of what kind of pedagogy or technology to use and most teachers have the mastery of the content. They are good at selecting the pedagogy, but then not every kind of technology or not every kind of tool suits the teaching of that particular content or the pedagogical style you want to use in the classroom. So you need that knowledge, that what we call the technological pedagogical content knowledge. So you need that mix to know, okay, this is what I want to do. This is my learning um, objective. And then this is the technology that best suits the style I want to use to deliver this content and help me enhance the understanding of this content. So you need to know how to select a tool. You need to know how to analyze it to see if it actually suits what you want to do with it and help you achieve your learning goal. Because it's all about the learning objective, not just the use of technology for technology's sake. Yeah, that's that's a wonderful three part framework that you're talking about there. And I wonder if you if, a, if an example readily comes to mind for you of a piece of content that really didn't translate well to the technology uh, technology format that you may have been uh, hoping to uh, use it within. Is there is there an example of that within the last couple of years that that comes to mind? It's already gets. Oh, uh, when you're talking about a piece of content not really being suited to a particular technology or technological environment. Is there an example that comes to mind for you of something in the last couple of years that really didn't translate very well into that environment? Okay, so um, for instance, let me give uh, an example. Okay, we know that um, one of the common tools for use, um, especially in the classroom, is uh, your, your slides, your, mm -hmm. your PowerPoints. And the PowerPoint presentation doesn't actually address every form of uh, kind of uh, engagement. And so, for instance, I want to teach maths. And there are other math tools that allow for you to collaborate. For instance, if I'm using OneNote and I'm using um, the math tool and I'm sharing that note with all my students and they all can collaborate on that space um, to work out that mathematics equation, that has a better output than um, presenting 
uh, uh, rigid content on my, of mathematics solutions just um, using a PowerPoint presentation. And so because PowerPoint is there, it's easy to use, and sometimes it's abused. And so for everything, oh, I'm projecting my, my lessons for my students, and we feel that that is the height of what we can do. But we see that different kind of uh, contents require different kinds of engagement. And for instance, I'm teaching a, li a literature class. Uh, maybe you have, you've written a book on tech humanists, and um, <laughs> talking about tech humanists uh, with my students. I think one of the ways to bring to life that content is to actually Skype with you or, or, or have you on, on, on Zoom and have my students connect with you via a live session and ask you questions concerning the content, content that, that you have written in your book. This is something that we can do because technology enables it. It will be difficult for you to have come into my classroom. You know, I mean, what did it cost me to have you fly over from, from wherever you are to Nigeria <laughs> to my classroom? But we can do this in real time because yes. we have technology enabling uh, this. And so, so you see technology yeah. rightly used in place. And then my students can ask you real-time questions concerning the content that you have written. And the, their learning on, on that topic is, is actually enhanced. I, I'm game for it, by the way. <laughs> I'm game. If you want me to come in your classroom, I'm, I'm game. And in person, too. Next time I happen to be in Nigeria, I hope that we'll get a chance to, to meet in person. Or if you're in New York. Uh, you know, I love that example, though, about the collaborative math teaching. You know, that, that you're right, of course. Slides, PowerPoint, they don't translate for everything. But that example of collaboratively solving a math problem I mean, that gave me chills on the back of my neck. It's a really brilliant example, and it really feels like a powerful illustration of how kids can can collaborate in these rich technological environments. And I know we're we're getting close to the end of our time, and I wanted to make sure to ask you about the background. Now, it, we're this isn't going to translate for people listening on audio only, but you have to know that the background behind Dr. Oluwakemi is uh, handprints at the end of tree branches. And now I understand from our discussion pre-show that that's your kids' handprints, right? Your own children? Yes, uh, yeah. So when we first moved into the house, I, the, I'm sure the handprints are different now. When we first moved in <laughs> a few years ago, we had uh, this uh, tree stump painted on, and so we had different colors of uh, paint. and. Uh, each person was assigned a color, and so you just go put your handprints on the wall uh, to make the leaves of the print. And um, so, even though we have repainted some other parts of the house after then, uh, this place remains the same way. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful! It's just really, really charming, and it really seems like it it works so well with who you are and what you're committed to, and and what you're passionate about. The other thing I wanted to ask you is, I saw somewhere that you said that your family hasn't been to the cinema since COVID started. So you've been projecting movies on your wall and watching with your family. Is that right? Yes, we do movie nights. <laughs> what, uh, what are some things that you've watched together recently that re you really loved? Oh, uh, we've watched, um, well, we've, we've watched um, recently that we watched and watch over, we watched Hal Renton, um, the story of, <laughs> uh, yeah, the, yeah, you are United States president. We love the music hall by Lynn, and so we've watched it over and over. And so that's one of our family favorites, though, yes. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, Hamilton's a favorite here as well. It's, of course, uh, New York, the greatest city in the world. <laughs> the line that we always quote in our household. <laughs> I'm not going to miss my shots. Yeah, I'm not going to miss my shot. Uh, hey, I, I know that, you know, you are joining us talking about technology, talking about humanity in the form of little humans, young humans that we're shaping into full, full grown humans. I wonder if you identify with the idea of tech humanism. And if so, how are you a tech humanist? Is that something that you can relate to? Well, I, I actually like the humanist uh, uh, puts besides the tech. It just gives some um, human nature to technology <laughs> because sometimes um, it can feel quite rigid and um, like something loss of emotions and all that. And then since I um, uh, advocate for the, how would I put it, you know, empathy and social and emotional learning while we also train on um, the digital skills and ICT skills. So I like to put 
um, that alongside with the digital skills training we do. So people know that um, there isn't really a dichotomy between your online self and your offline persona. The online and offline persona should be the same. And so if I'm kind as a person, even when I'm online, when I'm using tech, I should be kind in my use of tech and kind when I'm online engaging in the digital space. And so because of that, I love the fact that the humanist, <laughs> you have the humanist at, added to the technology here. And so I am a tech humanist. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's wonderful to hear. I also, you know, one of our other recurring themes here on this show is that of seeing a possibility for a brighter future if we work for it. And I honestly, there are a few people that I've met who seem to be working harder for it than you are. So I wonder in what way are you hopeful for the future and where do you think our efforts and resources should best be directed? Okay, so I would speak from the educational point of view. Yes. <laughs> and as one who has, who's looking at the future of my kids and, uh, I know that the fusion of technology is beginning to blur border lines and um, boundaries. And um, therefore, I believe the efforts should be um, put uh, focused towards the development of global competencies for our students. You know, um, because um, the world without doubt has become more in interconnected. And um, coming from a developing country, we know that much more than now, um, there it becomes more imperative that we train our students to be globally competent, to develop uh, the skills, and then to know how to live, learn, and work even in the global village. So global competency for me is it's key. And uh, as we make these global connections also, because um, like I'm making a global connection with you right now, and yes. uh, this is beginning to happen. People are working remotely, and you, know, you have more global communities uh, rising. Our students also need to be aware of what it means to be digital citizens and how to successfully navigate and interact in uh, within the digital space. And um, so making um, sure that such connections uh, and the learnings about the diverse uh, and cultures of these people and um, also coming to the understand uh, that our value systems are similar um, because I believe that um, respect in one culture is respect for the other. And this shows that things like kindness and empathy uh, among our global needs across board. And so we need to learn how to be good citizens, how to develop global competencies, and also learn to appreciate differences um, when they exist. And so for me, that's um, the future I see. People who uh, are in the community and not, um, not, not aware of our differences, and yet are uh, able to embrace the differences and work along Side each other, even in the global um, setting. So, I, I think that's a wonderful vision. And I don't know if you had a chance to see it. I, I briefly put it up on the screen. We had a comment from uh, someone on LinkedIn who really resonated with the idea of kind in life and kind online. Yes. So that that is uh, I, that really got to me too when you said that. It's a beautiful idea. I think that's a wonderful value that you're instilling in in students and young people. Uh, I just want to thank you so much for the work that you're doing, for the vision that you're bringing to to education technology, to education in general, and to the to our world. So thank you so much for being here and for sharing that vision with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, uh, that about wraps up the Tech Humanist Show today. Thank you so much for listening to the Tech Humanist Show. If you're looking for more inspiring people and inspiring views you can find information about the show's guests and link to their projects at thetechhumanist.com where you can also find more episodes or you can subscribe at itunes or wherever you get your podcasts i'm kate o'neill join me again next time for more about how data and technology shape the human experience thank you very much <laughs>